in 2018, a new story began. It's a huge day today because I introduce our 10-year vision called 10, 10, 10. The idea? To see more people come to know Jesus, to build partnerships in new communities, to be and love like Him. So here we are. It's 2023. And now, at the halfway point of our 10-year vision, what was once a dream is being realized. We're seeing churches planted, partnerships developed, lives impacted here, near, and far. God has already used the here, near, far vision to reach and impact so many with His love. And He's only just begun. His love builds. Hello, friends. Thanks for joining us online at West Tonka at Bush Lake, wherever you might be coming from. Glad we're together today for what I will call a happy Sunday. For several reasons, it's a happy Sunday because it's the first Sunday of spring. Yes, I think the God of the seasons brings new life. And I'm so grateful for spring that's just here and around the corner with all the flowers ready to come and join us. It's also a happy Sunday because it's March Madness. I can't help it. I just love it. And to think that there's no number one seed in the final tournament, I don't know. It means we're all busted at the same time. So it's just a beautiful gift for those who care. And it's a, it's a happy Sunday as well, a jubilant Sunday, a celebration Sunday, because it's a commitment Sunday for Love Builds after a long journey beginning early in January. And we're just thrilled to be able to come to this given point. If you're a guest, thanks for being here. You could not pick a perfect Sunday to come. And let me give you some context. Um, Over the last uh, month plus, I've invited our church to become FPs, first paragraphers. I've invited our church, I've invited you as our church to say yes, to put your name and your story in Westwood's next chapter called Love Builds. It's a two-year generosity initiative. It's $9 million dollars above and beyond our regular tithes and offering in order to accelerate our here, near, far um, mission and vision as well as to um, reach our goals by 2028. So if you're a guest, I just want to invite you to take it in and stand in awe that God is on the move in the world, in our nation, in our backyard, and in our local neighborhoods. And we as a church are saying, yes, we're gonna move where God is. And that's what this day really is, the culmination of this long journey. We're also wrapping up Nehemiah chapter 12. So Nehemiah will be will complete this series, and what a great series. I hope you've benefited from the learning from God's word. It's been meaningful to me. Pray it has been for you as well. And I think about this journey because Nehemiah, really, we've been on parallel tracks. He was inviting the people of God to be FPs, to be first paragraphers, to say yes, to put their name and their story in the first paragraph of Jerusalem's next chapter called Love Builds. And that is a chapter of rebuilding the city because in our journey, we've learned that for over 90 years, actually, it's a total of 140, but a primary focus of 90 years where the walls have been completely destroyed, the city is in ruins, and the reputation of God has been slammed. And that's not a good day when God's name and his fame has been harmed. And so there's this journey, these underdogs, the the city of Jerusalem, the people of God were underdogs trying to rise up from the ashes. Two times in those 90 years, there were attempts to rebuild the city and they all failed. And then... Um, they, after 52 days, come in, the wall gets rebuilt, the city's starting to flourish, and they're going to invite then um, this opportunity for the people of God to dedicate the wall and themselves to the Lord. That all happens in Nehemiah 12. I can't get this out of my head. I have this picture of the NCAA. It's like being in the locker room. And, and the underdogs, the number 16 seed beats the number one seed. And it's actually happened. And to be in that locker room, it's uncorked joy. And that's what we've been tasting. That's what's been happening in the city. I want to do a little bit of the journey and the review since we're wrapping up Nehemiah today because you kind of ask the question, how did this happen? How did God see that this would come to fruition? Well, God would place it in the heart of one of the Jewish exiles living in Persia to make that trip a thousand miles to Jerusalem. He had never been there, but he comes as a man of character to lead the initiative that God has in store. So the first part of our journey was to say that the big door of leadership swings on the small hinge of character. Character 
always leads. Can we do a little review? We find that character builds. And in chapter one, we learn from Nehemiah the value and power of prayer that we have to do more than pray, but don't do anything until you pray. That prayer, if you want to see God work in you, through you, and, um, and, and for you, you, you want to be part of this journey of prayer. So we've ignited a lot of prayer expressions within our own community of faith. And then character builds planning. The reality of this character of Nehemiah that reminds us that great planning that aligns with God's purposes for success in your personal life is always a prayer plus equation. It's prayer plus waiting. It's prayer plus courage. It's prayer plus the planning itself. It, we've got to pull it together. In fact, it goes to chapter three where we learned about this beautiful art of motivating people that we're better together when we're in it together was that message. We're not better together just because we're together. We're better together when we're in it together. And for the first time in 90 years, they got in it together, and it would be a powerful motivator for them to move forward with organization. That motivation with organization, it accelerates completion, and you know the opposite is true. That motivation without organization accelerates frustration. You've been to a lot of rah-rah gatherings, but there's no organization, to, no infrastructure to make it happen. They put that in place. And of course, we saw his character, especially in chapter six and seven, when there was so much conflict. And we learned how to manage conflict on those days from Nehemiah, that character quality that's so good, not to be conflict avoiders, but to be conflict managers. All these messages are, are online for your benefit if you missed any of them. But that was a powerful one, to be reminded that everything worthwhile is uphill is what we learned. And so he experiences conflict inside the city from the people of God, outside from op opposers to the, the city and to the people of God. And so the invitation was be front door conflict managers, not side door at the water cooler. It's not a way to handle conflict, not back door speaking about people and things. It's come through the front door and God will honor that initiative. And then we wrapped up that whole section in the first half of Nehemiah with that call for discernment, which is that capacity to discern, to, to be able to see what is and understand what is right or wrong, true or false, good or evil, because there were people saying things that were completely untrue that created confusion in the camp. Does that sound familiar in today's world? People just share their opinions, true or not. We go, well, what is true? And we learn some of those principles of discernment. And then the door would swing into the last half of Nehemiah where we've been the last five weeks. And that is simply this call that the big door of leadership now swings on the small hinge of love and how powerful is love. In fact, we've called it love builds up. And in the chapter that we jumped into in chapter eight on consolidate was this reminder that um, that it makes us strong when we consolidate, that love makes us strong, that when we consolidate who we are with what God has given us, it unites us together in a strength and a foundation of love. And then we moved into the chapter speaking about prioritization. Many of these people have been in exile. They're coming back in and they're trying to figure out what's most important in life because God and his ways weren't all that important, but now they are. They're into God big time. And two things popped out of the page in that chapter that prayer's our way forward and worship is our starting place. And they unite together with that foundation of love in prayer and worship and the place gets ignited, as it does for us when we make that a priority in our own family situation as a church. And then we move to that beautiful chapter of repopulation that, that the reality is there weren't enough people in the city to rebuild the city so it could flourish. And so they put together a plan and the character strength of that love, let me just tell you, love smells good. It just does. There's something attractive when you put sweet rolls in on the morning. That's an act of love. And love has an expression that makes people want to come back in. And I did make a connection to the pandemic for, I mean, I'm grateful. We have online. So grateful for all of you that are online. And yet, we're also inviting, if you can, to return back into the, one of our sites, into our campuses, to repopulate so we can re-flourish because it takes a lot to be able to serve the needs of God in our community. And then last week, we talked about recalibrating. The, you know, they weren't into God, now they are. They were outside of the city of Jerusalem, now they've come back. And they have to recalibrate their lives to what's most important. We covered a number of things, but top of the list, if you recall, was a, a six-hour sermon. I just loved it. <laughs> Planting a seed. 
in your future. A six-hour sermon is going to come your way. And it was a six-hour worship expression, prayer expression, teaching expression from the Word of God. They put the Word of God back to the top of their lives because they had gotten away from the Word of God. And I gave that challenge last week. 12 minutes a day in the Word of God. Next year, you will not be the same person this time. Your mind will be stretched, your heart enlarged, your faith ignited for the purposes of God. Your joy will rise when you're in the Word of God. And because I know that many people are still trying to find their way back into knowing God and His Word, I gave the invitation that if you don't have a Bible, you can certainly stop by and our ushers will give you a Bible. I'm just going to tell you, friends, we ran out of Bibles before the end of the service last week. And many people say, I, I want to get back into the Word of God. That speaks to the heart. God is honored in that. So we've repopulated our Bibles. They're available for you today. If you don't have a Bible, you can stop today. We'll be glad to give that to you. And then today we get into dedicate, the name of the title of the message today. Let me give you a definition of dedication. The act of committing, devoting, or pledging yourself to someone or something. So they enter into this place and they now dedicate themselves to the living God. The city, the walls, the flourishing, their personal lives. And that's what we're going to do at the end of our service as well. So I, I tee up a question. Um, what is it that they offered as they dedicated themselves to God? And in chapter 12, you see four ways that they offered themselves to God. And I think they're parallel to exactly what we want to do as we look to this next chapter of Westwood's story called Love Builds. You ready to jump into those four? I'll touch on them briefly. Give me a yes, an amen. Yes. Good. Thank you. Appreciate that. Let's go. Offer God honoring singing. That's where they start. That is, from the tip of their toes through the expression of their mouths, they sing songs that are fueled by a joy. They, they praise God for who he is, what he's done, and what he's doing right now. They're overwhelmed. 90 years they've been in this, this place of decimation, and now the, the, the walls are rebuilt. The city is starting to flourish in beautiful ways, and they're undone by the goodness of God, and it all happened in 52 days for the walls, and we find that Nehemiah calls us out this way. At the Dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, the Levites, who um, were brought to Jerusalem to celebrate joyfully, and this becomes a key word, the dedication with songs of thanksgiving and with the music of cymbals, harps, and lyres. I also assigned two large choirs to give thanks. So some of it is organized and planned, like what we do on our Sunday gatherings. We're planned, we're organized, we know what's coming up. Some of it is serendipitous and free-flowing expression of joy through song, kind of like flash mobs. Remember flash mobs? Would pop up in a mall on a street and orchestra members would come out, <laughs> vocalists would come out, and they just start to sing. Nobody saw it coming. It was just serendipitous. It brought this contagious joy. And not everybody could sing in tune. But everybody sang. And I just want to say, not all of you can sing in tune. I've heard some of you. But the joy. I'm just saying, when we express um, our joy in song, whether you sing in tune or not, I've been by some of you who cannot sing in tune, but I catch your joy, and so does God. It's a beautiful thing. Let your heart of joy be expressed in song, and who cares whether you can sing in tune or not? Just let it go and be free before the Lord. It does a beautiful thing. You get a glimpse of the joy that's happening in Jerusalem on this special day. In fact, Carrie and I were in, in uh, Jerusalem just a few years ago, and we happened to be at a hotel, and there was a wedding, a Jewish wedding taking place just outside the hotel. So we're taking it in. And of course, the wedding dance includes that beautiful rendition of Hava, Nagila Hava, Nagila Hava. You get my deal? You just start snapping, then you start singing. This is what I picture. Jerusalem, dancing and singing, snapping and loving each other in a beautiful expression. And can I tell you, they were loud. They were loud. Take a look. It says, the sound of the rejoicing in Jerusalem could be, could be heard far away. Now, there's a nuance here I want to be sure that you get. It's not that their songs could be heard far away. It's that their joy could be heard far away. That is a great thing to sing, and people are drawn by song, but the sticky is the joy because people long to know 
joy and to express joy in their life from the depth of their very being. And that's what happens. There's a joy and people are caught up in what they feel is a joy that they want to be part of and they're coming into the city to see what is taking place. This joy of the Lord is a beautiful gift in song that he gives to us. And I'm so glad that he does. I came across this Harvard study recently that um, really it, it presented what they learned from a survey they had done on happiness. That if a, it, it's about happiness and how it spreads through social networks. And they said if you come into your social network and you're filled with happiness, a joy from within, that their research indicates that there's, you have a friend close by, that its impact on the friend is that they have a 25% higher chance of becoming happy with you, even if they're crabby when you meet them. And then they express it. To, there's a domino effect of the spreading of joy. And I think you'd agree with that, that happiness is infectious. It's contagious. If you're going out with somebody on Friday night and you call them and say, I'd love to be with you, you're not calling an unhappy person, generally speaking. You're looking for an uptick, a joyful expression. I was in my journal recently. It's an old journal, and I found these words. I didn't write the author down, but I must have liked the words enough. I included them, and it says, if happiness were a disease, none other would be more contagious. If you laugh often, if you are having fun in life, if you're never very far from a smile, you'll have no trouble infecting and making friends. People who really enjoy life are always, always in demand. They are unbelievably infectious. There's a joy that comes, even in hard stuff in life. And we find the people in Jerusalem really taking the words of the psalmist to heart. When the psalmist says, in your right hand, O God, is the fullness of joy. And they're feeding themselves in that fullness of joy. So they offer this God-honoring singing. But secondly, they offer God-honoring confession. That something happens when you confess your sin. Um, that there is a, a, a release, a happy countenance that comes with the confession of sin and before they come to dedicate themselves, as we have seen again and again throughout all of Nehemiah, this both personal and this corporate expression of confession. And they ready themselves in verse 30. When the priests and the Levites had purified themselves ceremonially, they purified the people, the gates, and the wall. We're not coming to make our offering until we first confess. It's a powerful thing. We know that to be true. 1 John 1, 9 in the New Testament Reminds us if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness so that there, we're set free, that there can be a joyful countenance that takes over our lives because of what God does in, in just receiving us and forgiving us. And I go, well, what's the difference between God-honoring confession and, uh, and God-honoring repentance? There, there, there's a difference here because God-honoring confession is the act of communicating to the Lord I am so um, undone, Lord, by my sins, by the things that I've said, by the things that I've done that distance myself from your very love. But repentance is the promise to turn to God so that you can be washed away of your sins. We can't do it in our own strength. So Acts reminds us, turn to God so that he will wash you away of your sins. So the sins can be taken and removed. The strength to move into a renewed place requires a repentance of heart. So we come into this place and say, before we come and receive our offerings before the Lord and dedicate ourselves, let's just move to a place of confession. Would you join me in this? Would you just, in this moment, close your eyes, wherever you might be at all of our sites, just close your eyes. And would you take in a deep cleansing breath? Join me. And release it slowly. Father, we settle ourselves. You remind us to be still and know that you are God. And in this moment, we confess to you that we have sin that is often an obstacle that can often cause us to draw away from rather than toward you. So friends, would you just take this moment of private reflection and say, Lord, I confess to you my sin of you fill in the blank in this moment. Father, I wonder what you hear all 
the confession coming up, but the gladness to meet us in that given place. And for that, we rejoice. So again, would you take another deep cleansing breath, join me, and release it? Amen. Let the Lord set you free. May I have your eyes? That's a personal expression. But what we've seen again and again throughout Nehemiah is the strength of the we, the communal expression. So I have a little responsive confession. You start, we start together, then I have a brief word, and then we'll close together in a unison of reading. Would you join me? I repent, Lord. I repent. I have been wrong in supposing that I could manage my own life and be my own God. We lean into the realization that what you want from us and what we want from you are not going to be achieved by doing the same old things, thinking the same old thoughts together. We repent, Lord, we repent. So before they came in their offering, they offered God-honoring confession. But then we find that there's another expression. They offer God-honoring testimonies. That is, they give witness to the reality of God at work in their lives, and it's really quite compelling to see what they have done. If you know God, then there is this impulse to make God known, that we were never meant by God to receive his love for our own benefit. It was always to be extended and expressed to others. God intended that your story of faith would touch the lives of others and maybe even see some come to faith because of their story. Throughout Nehemiah 12, I don't have the margin to share all the stories um, that are stated there of people um, increasing the fame of God by sharing the stories of their lives transformed. I did choose one verse um, that Yeshua was among them, Cadmio, Judah, and also Mataniah. Oh, is that name familiar to you? from a few weeks ago, who was in charge of the songs of thanksgiving. Remember Mataniah? I I gave some attention to him because he showed up a few weeks ago. He shows up two times um, with responsibilities that are his, both in finding stories of God's goodness and connecting them to songs of thanksgiving. That his name means God's hope. That he is a hope giver. And I think that is a gift from God because we all need hope. And he would bring hope both inside the city to the people of God who are there, but also outside of the city. And friends, we need hope. Do you agree we need hope in our lives? We need people to give us hope that surround us, but we also give to, get to give hope to others in their journey. And Metaniah is this hope giver. He's the storyteller of hope to those inside and outside. And that's why I said a few weeks ago, that if you're having a baby, can I name your baby Mataniah? I was really serious. It's only been three weeks. Nobody's taken me up on the offer so far, but I'm hopeful that you will, because why not name your son Mataniah the hope giver to people not just inside the church, but to the world around us? Isn't that a cool name? I know I'll keep coming to Mataniah in the years ahead. By the way, we do have a story within our own church family I'm gonna come to in just a short while. Um, Steve and Christy Conley, but I'll get to that um, as before we come up and make our offerings because there's one more offering I want you to see, and that is they offer God-honoring generosity. Remember last week, if you were here, these people are coming back, and God was not first in their life. They weren't into God, but now they are. They weren't back in Jerusalem with the temple, but now they are, and they've recalibrated, as we learned last week, their giving priorities. Many of them hadn't given to God's work in decades. But now they've recalibrated their lives and they're completely taken up in it. So we saw last week the categories of their generosity. It was really amazing. Some gave gold and silver and cash, but some didn't have that. So they gave grain and wood and some didn't have that. And so they came alongside and gave from their flocks and their herds and the olive trees as well as the fruit trees, their first fruits. What a gift this was. And we turn the page to chapter 12 and the impact toward flourishing is astonishing. Take a look at what it says. At that time, men were appointed to be in charge of the storerooms for the contributions, first fruits and tithes. So in the days of Nehemiah, all Israel contributed the daily portions. They go from a place of scarcity where there's nothing in the storerooms 
to a place of abundance that because God was first in their giving, it filled the storerooms to meet the needs of the city so it could flourish and even meet the needs outside of the city so it could flourish. This generosity is compelling, and the picture that they give to us is one that we want to exemplify as a commitment to God through faith in Jesus Christ and through his church here, near, and far. We'll do that in a moment when we joyfully offer ourselves in an act of dedication, as they did um, at the conclusion of their worship expression when they had come together. You came today with, um, or at least if you didn't come with it, we put it on your seat, a commitment card. And I want to take a moment and just speak about the significance of a commitment card. A couple phases to this before we come. First of all, why do I have a commitment card? That question was raised. And some people just want to give without a commitment card. And certainly you can do that. But can I give you reason why it's helpful? First of all, there's a biblical reason that it's helpful. It clarifies um, God's love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And we find that it is personal, it's voluntary, voluntary that he gives himself, it's sacrificial and joyful when he comes, but it's also physical, it's a tangible expression so that our humanity could see who Jesus is and understand what it is to love, to be in love like him. That's the picture we have, that we know that we give because God first gave to us. And it's a physical reminder because it was from his first, first roots, his highest and best for us. And so we give as a tangible physical reminder of that generosity of God given to us. Then there's a personal reason. And it clarifies what's important in my life that the priority of my heart is aligned with the priority of God's heart for the families of the earth, not just my family, but families here, near, and far. That's the heart of God. Our here, near, far mission and thrust is to say, God, we know your heart. We want to be part of it. And when we care for more than just our families, our faith grows exponentially, and our joy increases exponentially. And then there's a practical reason. It brings clarity to the very voice of Jesus himself and the church that he birthed Because God accomplishes his purposes through the local church, which is why we make that a priority of our giving to the local church. And so when we give, um, you're helping the church lead to make decisions, the leaders of the church make decisions that are, are wise, that fit the mission and the heart of God. And because we're in it together, that gives us clarity at how do we move into the future together. And then we get to hear the voice of Jesus himself when he says, well done, good and faithful servant. Or better still, well done, good and faithful church. That there's one head, Jesus Christ, and we're all connected by faith to the body of Christ. That's why we encourage you to give a card. And then the specifics of the card also are outlined there. And you can tell, and I want to encourage those that are online, you can see the QR code, you can download it there or go to our website. I just want to take a moment and walk through this um, briefly because it's set up a bit like a workshop. And you can take advantage of as many lines there as you want. But we want to be sure we have clarity of what Love Builds is making the distinctive from your normal, regular giving to that of Love Builds, which is above and beyond its expanded giving, two years, $9 million. We wanted to be sure we were clear with that, so we included the card to give you perspective. A top line, what we normally give a year, which, by the way, if you've never given, as we learned last week from the people of God, if you've never given to the work of God, Take that step of God-honoring generosity and become a first-time giver. And you could use that top line there if you want to utilize it. The second line speaks about the love builds, that this would be above and beyond that regular giving. There's other things recommended there, too, that you could pay attention to. Let me just say, it might be the simplest thing, is fill out the bottom line. The bottom line that says, um, our two-year love builds commitment is. That's the simplest thing to do. We just want to be sure you understand the distinction in it. So... Here we go. Let's offer ourselves to the Lord. Let's dedicate ourselves to his heart for the families of the earth. And I'm gonna invite the worship leaders at all of our sites to make their way and come, and they're gonna be leading us in worship in just a moment. I wanna invite you just to take a moment, and if you came with your card filled, great. If you need a few moments to pray, maybe even whisper to um, somebody who might be with you um, that you would want to give, then go ahead and take that time, fill out the card. In a moment, you're going to see a story of God honoring testimony with Steve and Christy. But after that story, I'll come up and pray, 
make my way down, and then Carrie and I and the campus pastors will make their way to the front. They will lead the way, and then you come forward as you feel led. I want you to hear this story. Steve and Christy, I had the opportunity to meet with them. I was just flat out moved by their story. Kind of invaded their comfort zone. I said, would you be willing to send, tell your story before a church family? And, and they did agree. And I'm glad that they did. Um, Steve and Christy have quite the story of their own journey. First of all, how they met is very, very funny. You'll enjoy hearing that. But how they live by faith is just extraordinary. Steve's a science guy. He's a guy who um, is a surgeon as well as uh, an administrator in a medical arena, a deep thinker, and so is Christy. She was a physical therapist, but how they come together to meet with each other is a beautiful story of love. How they meet Jesus is a beautiful story of love, and they are one of 125 people who've already made their commitment to Love Builds, and that is um, our staff, our leadership board, and other leaders have already said, I'm in. So they were one of the first to give. That's why I got to hear their story. I was moved by this God-honoring testimony, and I know you will be as well. This is Steve and Christy. We first met back in 1990. I was in medical school at the University of Wisconsin and Christy was in physical therapy. And uh, one day, uh, we were both in anatomy lab. She was across the hall from, from me. And we had a problem with our cadaver, our body, if you will. And so we decided to go across the hall into the physical therapy uh, student anatomy lab. And we saddled up to the table and uh, it happened to be Christy's table. So we met over uh, a cadaver, over a dead body. Steve and I both grew up going to church with our families and I think after we got married and especially after we had the first two boys, we kind of were drifting away from church, um, got harder and harder to go um, and we kind of got to a point where something was missing and someone invited me to a Bible study because it was free childcare. <laughs> I had three little boys under the age of five, and someone was offering to watch them while I got to learn about Jesus. And I went out and bought my first study Bible and went to my first Bible study and fell in love. I could see the change in her calmness, um, certainty about the future, strength. And so that's what um, kind of started my own journey uh, into a deeper relationship with God. And, and um, it culminated with both of us being uh, baptized um, in Lake Riley, and it was nice because our boys got to see us do that. In 2018, um, just on a routine exam, um, I was found to have lung cancer. They decided to take out the upper right lobe of my lung. After that, because they did not get clear margins, I was stage 3B. After recovering from the surgery, I went through chemotherapy for several months. And at that point, we thought that the cancer was gone. So they started me on what was to be a year treatment of immunotherapy. Um, basically, every two weeks, I'd go in for an uh, infusion. And in January of 2020, we got the news that the cancer was back. And it was now stage four. It was in both my lungs, and it was also in my brain. From the first time that we found out that this was cancer, I, I had a peace, and that peace was from Jesus. I, I knew I was not alone in the journey ever. Our family saying whenever we have tough times is game on, and we looked at each other and just said, game on, let's face this. I mean, I think, our faith in God has allowed us to not let the cancer define us. And, and I think um, our faith is central to, to how we live our lives that way. So after we found out it was back, the next um, step was to do another biopsy of one of the nodules in the left lung. It came back as a certain type of genetic mutation for which there is a drug uh, that, 
that we were eligible to take because of, it um, helps somewhat put the cancer in uh, hibernation, if you will. When I started this beginning of February 2020, I was told 50% of the people may make it to 18 months and the most they had made it to at that point was 34 months. And as of today, I'm at 37 months on the drug and still no growth in the lungs. We can step back and see in spite of this how blessed we are and we're blessed because of our faith. And so, the Love Builds um, initiative, if you will, is and our support for it is a way to hopefully give other people hope and strength when they're facing whatever adversity it is that they're facing, um, knowing that God is with them and will support them and, and wrap his arms around them.